Welcome to the talk on Ikate. And um, we're going to do a little bit, a uh, little Kata Basis. Uh, it's, we're going to slowly descend into this material. And we are going to go very deep. So, but the deepest part is towards the end. Gradually, uh, through various layers, uh, we will get there. But uh, I guess we got to start that, uh, you know, Hikate is associated uh, with other, you know, certain other goddesses. Um, uh, she was born uh, to the Titans, according to some traditions, uh, Persis and Asteria. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, she was the guide uh, to Demeter as she sought her daughter, Persephone, right? Uh, piercing the night of the underworld with her uh, torches held in each hand, right? Uh, her role in Hades is, is very well known, uh, working for Persephone, excuse me, in Hades and various tasks, right? Uh, she's, she's connected with Artemis, obviously, uh, Selene, you know, the goddess of the, the moon, uh, Despoina, right? Uh, and and a few others, Cretes, the Tarian, uh, Kersonus, the Cloakian, uh, Nymph Perseus, the heroine, Epiphagenia, say that three times fast, right? The Thracian goddess, Bendis, uh, the Euboean Nymph Mara, or the Dog Star, the Elusian Nymph Daria, and the Botian Nymph Hertina. I love these words. But anyway, the point is, she is the queen of all nature. Uh, she is especially connected to like Demeter uh, and Rhea, Brimo, right? Kibbele, a whole bunch of names. But speaking of names, let's take care of the name controversy. <laughs> Sometimes a main controversy. Now you're going to hear her name all these different ways. It's almost as diverse uh, as the name Isis, you know, <laughs> you're going to have everybody fighting about how to say it, what's the proper way, you know, and Asat or Isat or Aset or yes, yes, yes. And we're going to have people uh, correcting each other all the time about how you're supposed to say it. Well, today we're going to just take care of that situation. Isn't that nice? And we're going to also go into connections to where the name came from. Well, okay, so there's a few theories okay so sometimes the greeks i'm going by the primary sources so why not the greeks sometimes will say that hecate is connected to the idea of will uh and um and that it is uh an obscure epithet for apollo for example uh ikatos hecatios right he that operates from afar we have that possibility, right? But it's, obviously, it will be the uh, feminine form. Others, uh, we'll see, is uh, is that uh, we'll say that she her name is connected to a pre-Olympian cathodic goddess, and so many scholars claim that her name uh, is not derived from Greek at all, but comes from ancient Anatolia, right? There is a claim that um, uh, that what will happen is Egyptians uh, trade about with Anatolia, especially the region uh, known as Caria, as well as Lycia. That's along the southern and western coast of Turkey today. And these Egyptians, they worship a midwife goddess by the name of Ikat, right? So the, and of course, that happens to be the protector of women in childbirth. Okay, so maybe it's that, right? Maybe it's it's like uh, you know the Egyptians arrived on the shores of Anatolia, and it's um, it just it caught. Well, yeah, maybe, but uh, and it's popular. But uh, there is also a indigenous goddess of Anatolia. Um, there is the the, the Hapian, uh, which of course is before the Hittites, uh, mother goddess, 
by the name. It's interesting. It, his name is, it's uh, Hat Kata. So, so, sorry, it's Kataha, which means divine queen. But it can be also uh, said as Hat Kata. Got it? Hat. That's like hat, hot, ka. I said hot. Sorry, hot, cut, ta. Sorry. So what, what what they often will do uh, in these languages is they'll have a consonant and then they will have the vowel after that. So the first part would be uh, the, the 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 hot. The next part would be the cut, and the final part would be the ta. That certainly sounds like. Hecate, does it not? It sure does. But wait a minute, Dr. Reachfeld, Hecate. Hot, cut, 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 ta. Ah, ah, ah. So uh, earlier on, that's why, that's why you always hear me say Hecate. Does that make sense? Because if you're going back to the Anatolian root of the word, it has that sound. Now, those people who say Hecate are going, oh, no. Oh no, we're wrong. No, you're not wrong. What? But you just you just said the original. Yes, but here's the problem, and it is a problem, and that is is that we have also Greek poetry, and we also have sounds that seem to rhyme. So there is evidence that there were Greeks who called her Hecate. So those people who say Hecate, you're right. Right, right. Those people who say Hecate, you're right. You guys are all right. You guys feel better now. So if you're going for the, the Hecate, that's kind of the Greek lyric kind of thing, the way it sounds. If you're going to the Hecate, you're kind of going the ancient Anatolian. But no matter what, uh, can't we all just get along? Isn't that great? We can start off taking care of a big controversy and we're all happy, maybe. Okay. Now, of course, now here are the problem with origins, right? We talked about the name. Let's go. Some people will say that she is from Thrace, right? And this is, of course, uh, the area uh, today uh, that is part of Greece, in which you have also a little part, a little Bulgaria in there, and you got right, you know, and you have a little Macedonia mixed in. You know, it's that area, it's Thrace. So they say that she is from that particular area. Um, uh, and um, there is absolute fact that she that there is a connection between her and the goddess by the name of Bendis, B E N D I S, uh, and that uh, Bendis is described as the one that has two spears. So you can see that seems to parallel the idea of the two torches, Hecate, right? Uh, Bendis uh, was uh, worship was accepted in Athens. It arrived around the fifth century BCE. And it's at the same time, the Hecate worship became more popularized in Athens and coming from Thrace. So and we know uh, we have, for example, uh, uh, Sophocles in the, in the fifth century will talk in his, in his lost play, but we have a fragment uh, known as the root cutters. Uh, Bendis was conflated with both, according to this source, Hecate and Kibbele, right? And uh, so we know that, and we know that uh, Hecate's worship also expanded into the regions of Thrace. But wait a second. But people are saying that Hecate comes from Thrace. See, this is where it gets interesting. Okay. So there is a connection with Thrace, and there's a lot of people who say, well, it must, she, must, she must originate in Thrace. Other people are saying, no, 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 she originates in Anatolia. Don't worry, I'll give an answer on that. We'll be there. But uh, anyway, so there is a controversy over this. Um, we do know that um, uh, uh, Bendis, uh, she was a nighttime deity. Okay, so she connected and she's very much like Artemis. Uh, she was, uh, Bendis was connected with the moon, right? Also the hunt. Uh, we know through the Oracle of Dodana. Uh, as a result of that, that's why this worship was introduced in the first place uh, in, in Athens. 
uh, in Plato uh, does mention her, right? In fact, there's even celebrations known as the uh, Benditia, right? Uh, which included horse races and, and, and of course, they're riding at this holding, ho holding porches, <laughs> right? You know, so Cook goes, you haven't heard that there is to be a torchlight race this evening on horseback in honor of the goddess. On horseback, said I, this is a new idea. Will they carry torches and pass them along to one another as they race with the horses? And, and how do you mean? That's the way of it, uh, said Polymarchus. And besides, there is to be a night festival which will be worth seeing. There you go. <laughs> so there's a little ancient flavor there. Hey, come on, let's go to the go to the horse race. You just don't burn yourself with the torches. Okay. So um, of course you play with, with Hikata, you do play with fire, right? So uh, she is shown uh, depicted just like Artemis in this context. However, uh, she has an Asiatic snug sleeved undergarment. Now, I went, that's interesting, you know. So she she short chitin, you know, short dress, but 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 she has her undergarment is from Anatolia. Doesn't seem like a Thracian thing, does it? Ah, you get me, right? It's like, well, it's kind of a mixture uh, in, in, as far as uh, as far as her her what she's wearing. Okay, so you're, you're getting where I'm going, right? <laughs> So Thrace is important, but it's not where she's from. I know, I know, I know a lot of books are going, no, no, she has to be from Thrace. In fact, I, uh, I went uh, I was in the classics department at UCI uh, learning Greek and Latin, and they were insisting it's Thrace. In fact, if you do the dictionaries online, you know, you'll see it's Thrace, it's Thrace, it's Thrace, Wikipedia, oh, Wikipedia. <laughs> uh, I'll say it's Thrace, and I say, no, it's not. Oh. And, okay, sorry, you scholars, you scholars, we just ruin everything, you know. That's why we have to keep publishing books, because uh, once we think we know something, something else is discovered, and then we have to write something new. It keeps us in business. So, so, um, so the next origin for Hecate, you know where we're going with this, is connected to Phrygia and Anatolia. And there are connections to Kibbele with, by the way, there's many... Uh, symbols that they share together, like for example, uh, the symbol of the dogs. Uh, Kibli and dogs are connected, you know. You know, lions. You know, there's a lot of depictions. People don't know this. We have Hecate with lions on either side, right? She's connected to torches, uh, Kibli torches and and serpents, and you know, caves as well. There's underworld aspect. Uh, to it. So this is, and, and, and of course, these are all connections to an earth mother, an ancient earth mother. You know, it's pretty old when they make the Kate connected with the Titans. <laughs> See, the Titans, that's the, that's the other group. You know, it's like, it's just the group before the Olympians. So already you can see uh, that she has earlier origins, right? Uh, and and uh, you have, um, of course, um, uh, there's, she's conflated in some cases with the Titan mother of the gods, Rhea. And uh, that's, that happens quite a bit, right? Uh, Kibli was worshiped at Ephesus uh, by the 10th century BCE, and she's connected to Artemis of the Ephesians, but there is a Hecate element uh, in connection to Kibli and Artemis of the Ephesians, which we will talk about later uh, in this lecture. Don't worry, I'll get there. So there is a connection, a very strong one at that. And um, uh, so anyway, uh, and as I said before, there seems to be a connection with uh, also the Neo-Hittite goddess uh, Kububa, right? In connection uh, to the Phrygian goddess. Now, once again, we're going back uh, from the Hittites, and look, lo and behold, we're back to that same old name again. Remember, remember? you know, Pot, Pot, Pot. That's right. We're back to her again. Uh, oh, so we have returned full circle uh, back to Anatolia, 
uh, and um, and this is something that most people know. Oh, here we go. So I work a lot with uh, in Turkey, uh, and uh, I work a lot with descriptions. And I, one of my favorite places to go, is in Ephesus, is ancient Caria. Caria and Lycia, they're really beautiful places. Take a look at the inscriptions there. It's like every, everybody is, it's like, it's like the word Hippate is everywhere. It's everywhere in the inscriptions. Uh, and, but you know, the problem is it's not published enough. So uh, you even have, for example, um, um, the father of Mausolus, uh, his name is Hecatius, <laughs> you know, but it is, it is part of familiar names. People are using this all the time at a very high concentration. So, 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 so this is a common name. You even have a shrine dedicated to Hecate at a place known as Lagina, L-A-G-I-N-A. -A. You got to go there. They have just restored uh, some of the pillars uh, as of within the last year. I mean, during the whole COVID situation, uh, archeologists need more things to do than crowd control and try to you know, keep things uh, uh, restored from tourist trampling on everything. So they had a little more time, so let's put up some pillars. It looks really good. Uh, and I do recommend going there and also, you know, be, um, cautious and don't, don't ruin the material culture. So there you have it. So ancient Caria, okay? So wait a second, you got ancient Caria, and then you have Thrace above. Is there a missing link? Yes, there is. Missing link uh, probably goes back to the Minoans. And the Minoans, as they interact with the Anatolians. I didn't say they originated the idea. <laughs> I'm saying they're carrying the idea. Uh, I do a lot of work with those known as Alluvians, L-U-W-I-A-N-S. And, um, and we know that the Alluvians interacted with the Minoans. In fact, we have a few uh, key words as a result of that from Alluvian, which we have, by the way, deciphered. And it's clear that even though the Minoans, as we know it, th and, and then the Mycenaeans after them, occupied the western shore of Anatolia of Turkey today. We also know that there was a transmission of those ideas going the opposite direction uh, from the Luvians, the Hittites, and of course, earlier Anatolian groups before that time. And that shows the kind of mixture, right? Many people say they're uh, because um, Hecate is connected to snakes, they'll make an association with the Minoan snake goddess. Yeah, okay. But, um, you know, that's, that's, that's more circumstantial a little bit. I mean, I could see that. I don't want to dig that far. As a scholar, I'm cautious. But uh, you take a look. I do, do, I do actually do find something in the Mycenaeans. You got you to gotta hold on to your horses a little bit. Uh, that's a good phrase for Hiccup because, you know, he's connected with horses. You don't know that. But hey, Poseidon is connected with horses too. You know, I know that. And that's an interesting point that we'll bring up in a few seconds. You're going to love this. Okay. So uh, we take a look at the, uh, uh, the Mycenaean tablets from a place called Pylos, around 1200 BCE, a little earlier, because, you know, sea people, they did their work on the place, but they did preserve it. And we find the name of a goddess uh, and in, in a linear B, and the name is, I'll spell it out, I-P-H-I-M-E-D-E-I-A. Hmm. Epimedia. Wow. Epi imp hmm. Epimedia. That sounds like something. Yeah, we find that. And she's connected to Persua and Duiya. <laughs> Of course, it's connected to the word God, right? Right. You got the feminine goddess, right? And um, in fact, um, we find that um, this word is used as an alternative name for Hikate. You're going, where are you getting this from? 
Well, we find this uh, in the catalog of women as connected to Hesiod, dating from the 8th century BCE. Oh, okay. And we got more connections to her. Oh, that's interesting. So Lydia B uh, names uh, this, right? Epi me de ya, right? The de ya is understood as the we ya, all right? So it's basically it's a goddess, right? It's the she. Uh, it's kind of like the she Zeus, right? <laughs> it's a divine one, right? Kind of, it's kind of cool, right there. And um, but this name is connected to another name, Epigenia. Wait a second. Wait, wait. I think I know that name. Yeah, that's the daughter of Agamemnon. <laughs> and you're going, okay, you're making connect. I am making connect. I told you this is going to be a scholastic talk. Aren't you glad? You know, I mean, not gonna... So what happens here is, is that the name breaks down. There is a connection between them. This gets better. So, and obviously, you know, Agamemnon <clears throat> uh, sacrificed uh, his daughter. Uh, Virginia, right, to what? To Artemis, <laughs> part of form. Uh, but we'll see what happens there in a few moments. But also, if you take the latter part of the word, Epa Medea, you get the word Medea. Hey, you heard of Medea, right? Media. <laughs> you know, the, 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 the sorceress from Elkus, you know, the, old, the whole jason and the argonaut story right and of course the name sometimes is connected to like the ink and the plan well is hey guess what hey isn't she connected to hecate too she is isn't she <laughs> so are you seeing the connections the connected cords right um so this name uh, by the way we're not even done yet we also find the name Epimedia, right, connected with Hecate, as well as Artemis, uh, even in the Odyssey, right? You know, right? remember this, you know? Um, so Odysseus, he's in Hades. Uh, he sees a ghost of uh, Eloise's wife, who is Epimedea, whose boast it was to have laid next to Poseidon. <laughs> oh, that's right, you know. And she bore him two uh, sons, one, you know, though their life was short, you know, they were giants. We have this also in the pseudo, uh, pseudo Apollodorus, too, we'll mention this as well. Uh, Epimedea falls in love with Poseidon. They made it together. Why is that important? Because uh, we do know for a fact uh, that going back to the Minoans and into the Mycenaeans, the Minoans, Poseidon, was the the husband or spouse of who? You guys know the spouse who? Spoke the spouse of the mother goddess, De Mater. <laughs> so De Mater, uh, of course, you know De or Ga, right? Mater. So what's what's that? What's what's that? You know. So of course you have uh, Ga or Ge or as in Gaia means, of course, earth, right? Mater means mother, so earth mother. And then pos, spouse, Ida. Ida is a derivative of the word da, which also, of course, means the spouse of who? Spouse of the earth. Hey, hey, hey wait. So wait a minute. You're just saying that Ate is a shadow aspect of the earth mother of Anatolia that is also connected to the Minoan and Mycenaean Goddess, oh, now everything's starting to make sense, isn't it, right? You're having all these epiphanies. Epigenia, right? <laughs> it's happening. Okay, you guys having fun yet? I am. I'm having a blast. Okay. Okay, so there we go. And so there is this connection that goes all the way back. Well, this, this is the part I really want to tell you. <clears throat> Ecate is really powerful and amazing even after this. She is powerful. And remember, think about the missing piece of the Minoans and Mycenaeans. It kind of makes, makes sense that you're going to have in Thrace, right? Evidence, right? That, that the Minoans they, and the Mycenaeans, they colonized all the way around the Aegean. So, of course, you're going to have connections in Caria, 
right? In, you know, in Lycia, along the Ionian coast. And of course, you're going to have uh, more uh, in the area of Thrace. That just, that just kind of makes sense, right? And it's interesting because there are islands in between that has hybrid aspects between the two. Just can't make this up. It's amazing. Okay. So let's go back to Hesiod. Oh, Hesiod, thank you, Hesiod, for existing, because uh, without you, we would ha not have a nice, wonderful connection uh, between um, uh, the, the Dark Age period uh, and going back to the, uh, the Minos and Mycenaeans, and of course, obviously going into the Classical period later on. He's around 700 BCE, and he writes in his Theogony about Hecate. All right, so I want to read this. I'll take it slowly, and it's worth every word. This is where I really want to focus in, although the mysteries will come later. I'm getting some water here. As I know, we have certain ideas of her, and I want to make sure, make sure that you know that that came later. That's right. No, no, that came later. So this is 700 BCE. I want you to hear how she's described. And then you're going to realize that she changes quite a bit later. This, and unfortunately, this is another reason why I say caught the basis, right? The descent, because she goes from just an amazing goddess to something that has has problematic aspects to it. That's not fair. Patriarchy, uh, it does things. All right. So Hesiod says, Hecate, whom Zeus the son of Cronos honored above all. I don't know. By the way, that's pretty. That's pretty good just there. So she's pretty exalted. I know you have her as this, you know, magical, mysterious goddess that's kind of shrouded and hidden and connected to knights and so forth. And but you know what? Uh, here, a little different here. Um, <clears throat> he gave <clears throat> her splendid gifts to have a share of the earth and the unfruitful sea. He received honor also in starry heaven. Oh, well, wait a minute. So she's not quite cathartic here, right? She's She has a Olympian, or I shouldn't say Olympian because she's Titan, Titanic, right? She has a, a, a heavenly or, or above aspect, but she also has a below aspect. She received honor also in starry heaven and is honored exceedingly by the deathless gods. For to this day, Whenever any one of men on earth offers rich sacrifices and prays for a favor according to custom, he calls upon Hikate. Huh. So that's going to change later on. But but at this time, Hikate, she's the go-to person. You know, hey, you want to do this? Um, great honor comes full easily to him whose prayers the goddess receives favorably. And she bestows wealth upon him. So she has at her disposal wealth, the abundance of wealth. Well, that, of course, uh, you know, Pluton right, comes from the earth. This is, you know, material aspect coming from her. For the power surely is with her. I want you to remember, power is surely with her. You're going to, because guess what's going to happen? The idea of power and Hikate, they go together. Later on, the idea of power and Akate, it connects all the way to the Chaldean oracles and into uh, Neoplatonic thought, where Hikate is the one who has the power, right? So it comes back. So this, is, this aspect is not lost. So I have some good news. Uh, she is going to have a revival uh, through the Chaldean oracles. Uh, and through Neoplatonism, I am looking at some others. It's fascinating. So there we go. Um, for as many as were born of earth and ocean, amongst all these, she has her due portion. Every word is loaded. So she is connected to sky, sea, and earth. Hey, look, three aspects. Uh, 
And so we're getting the idea where this originally comes from, uh, that she is in all three of these realms. No wonder she later on gets connected with the liminal spaces, the threshold spaces, the realm of the boundaries, right? Because this is how she, she connected all things together. Once again, this idea will be revived in Chaldean oracles and Neoplatonism, where, where there are these vortices that connect the above and below, and she is this world soul that holds it all together. Uh, and through, of course, her various spirits, through these various whirlpools, which we'll talk about later. Ooh, there's some mysteries, right? <laughs> okay. Moving on, the son of Kronos did her no wrong, nor took anything away of all that was her portion, which is all three areas of the former Titan gods, which she holds as the division was at the first, from the beginning, privileged both in earth and in heaven and in sea. Thank you, Hesiod, for doing this to us, right? There it is. You want it spelled out? I just spelled it out. No, of course, you know, you use the word spell, you need more. You know, there you have it. So Hikate uh, has a lot of areas under her mantle, doesn't it? You know, she's, she's very important. Um, she is, according to Hesiod, whom she will, she greatly aids and advances, right? She sits by kings and judgment, right? She connects to the assembly, right? And when men arm themselves for battle that destroys men, then the goddess is at hand to give victory and grant glory readily to whom she wills. Even the soldiers worshipped her. This is, this is common knowledge in 700 BCE. She's like, he's not talking about eons ago. He's talking about at that time. She is looked at that way, right? And to those whose business is in the gray, discomfortable sea, and who pray to Hikate and the loud, crashing earth shaker, who's that? Poseidon, <laughs> right? Right? Easily the glorious goddess gives great catch, and easily she takes it away as soon as it seems, if she so wills. Uh, so she's connected uh, to the seas, but she's already still, you can see, still there's this Poseidon connection. Right? There is a Poseidon aspect there. She is honored amongst all the deathless gods. Right. Okay. So from the beginning, she is a nurse of the young, and these are her honors. Oh, look, she's connected to the young, too, and nursing. Wait, this is Artemis, too. I know that they share this characteristic. Why? Because they're connected. They're all aspects of these ancient Anatolian goddesses. And this is now you understand how it connects together. Well, let's talk about the parentage. That's not controversial enough, right? So-called, you, know, you know, there are lots of stories of her parents, but, um, you know, Hesiod mentions this, uh, that, that uh, born of Persis and Asteria. I do want to go down this rabbit hole this vortices, so to speak, because it's, it's, it'll be worth it, right? So uh, not so much the father. Uh, he's, he's not as, as, as interesting, uh, but uh, I think the mother is interesting. And the mother, of course, is Asteria, right? Asteria, well, so who is Asteria? Well, Asteria... Uh, it has many of the same characteristics uh, as, as Hikate. Many of the same ideas are connected. And um, Asteria, uh, actually, uh, let's, let's have Cicero help me out here. Okay. In his, uh, he writes If you think Leto a goddess, how can you not think that Hikate is one who is the daughter of Leto's sister? Asteria. There we go. <laughs> hey, Leto. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, also, the goddess Nyx and Asteria are also connected, which is the realm of the night. So, Asteria is connected to the starry night. She's kind of the darker side of things. And she is the son. Uh, she, sorry, she is the, sorry, the sister of, of Leto. 
Why is Lito important? Well, Lito, last I checked, uh, gave birth uh, to two goddesses, Artemis and Apollo. <laughs> oh, now you're getting it. You know, it's like, wait, Lito's sister is Asteria. Oh, that makes Sakate oh, related. It sure does, right? In the family tree. They're all together. Oh, it gets better because in ancient sources, it says not only is uh, Artemis and Apollo born in the Ortigia Gardens, in some cases, they'll have a nurse by the name of Ortigia, and they say that she is really not Ortigia, but Asteria, and that she is looking after uh, Artemis and Apollo as the nurse <laughs> uh, that worked alongside Leto. Isn't that fun? Yeah, you're, you're going, this is really complicated, Dr. Rito. Of course it is. It's Greeks. <laughs> they got to make things complicated. If, if it wasn't complicated, we wouldn't be as fascinated, right? <laughs> okay, maybe not. Uh, so you have these connections. Uh, sometimes Hikate is also connected uh, to Demeter. And you're going to see a lot of sources talking about that. And you're going, well, how is she connected to Demeter? I kind of just talked about that, right? You know? So, of course, we had a derivation of Bay Mater, right? Who is what? Earth goddess? Oh, yeah. Okay. So you're seeing how these words are all connected. But I, I do have to say that there's another story of Demeter uh, that's connected uh, to, uh, to Hikate. And that's, of course, the Persephone story. Right, so here we go. Um, so we'll go there right now. Uh, we'll go to the Homeric hymn number two, dedicated to the Mater. It says, then, I want to read it because I, I just love this portion here. Then she, Persephone, cried out shrilly, of course, as she was seized by the god Hades, with her voice calling upon her father, the son of Kronos, which is Zeus, who is most high and excellent. But no one, either of the deathless gods or mortal men, heard her voice, nor yet the olive trees bearing with fruit. Only, I really want to read this, only tender-hearted Hikate, bright Coiffed, the daughter of Perseus, heard the girl from her cave and the Lord Helios. Oh, wait, tender hearted Hikate? Yeah, she's still tender hearted. She's kind. She's loving. Am I doing a lot right now to deconstruct Hikate for you? Is this changing things a little bit, right? You're going, wait, this is just tender. She's kind. Yeah, she wants to help out. Right? Right? So there you have it. Then, of course, then for nine days, queenly Deo, or Demeter, right, watered over the earth with flaming torches in her hands, which, of course, is reflected. Okay? So grieved that she never tasted ambrosia and the sweet drops of nectar, nor sprinkled her body with water. But, but with the with the tenth Enlightening dawn had come. Right. Uh, we shouldn't use that. Tenth enlightening dawn. You know, this is ninth enlightening dawn today. Hikate, now Hikate with her, a torch in her hands, plural. So she's, you know, you know, she's holding it like this. People will assume maybe it's two torches. Met her, met the meter, right? And spoke to her and told her the news. So wait, I mean. Hikate is going to help out? Of course, because she's she's kind. She's family hearted. I, I am so tired of seeing this goddess put down all the time, right? You can see now, it's like, well, this is, the revisionism is incredible. It sure is. Yeah. Okay. So what happens is she says, queenly Demeter. I like to say, I like to say Demeter because that's how he is to say it. Queenly Demeter or Demeter. Bringer of seasons and giver of good gifts, what god of heaven or what mortal man has wrapped away Persephone and pierced with sorrow your dear heart? 
For I heard, she says, a voice, yet saw not with my eyes who it was. But I tell you truly and shortly all I know. She's going to give, so she's giving knowledge. By the way, she is the one who does pertain or give knowledge. She later on is understood as the one who passes on knowledge. And so she is not only simply a fire bringer and a light bringer, but a knowledge bringer, the idea of gnosis, knowledge. And we're going to see that in the Greek magical papyri. Uh, we're going to see that in other sources as well, uh, Chaldean oracles and so forth. And for lateness. Okay, so there you have it, right? And so, and so then Hecate uh, did said as so, and the daughter of rich-haired Rhea answered her not, but sped swiftly with her, they're together, holding flaming torches in her hands. So they came to Helios the son, who is watchman of both gods and men, and stood in front of his horses, and the bright goddess inquired of him. Yeah. Although I want you to understand that Hecate is also known as for her brightness. It glows. She is the, that which illuminates. I want, to, I want you to understand that that continues also uh, towards the latter part of antiquity, when she is also known to have a glow and to be really bright. But she's connected with the moon uh, that, that emanates the light arriving from the sun. So, right? So, so she, in a sense, uh, is impregnated by the light of the sun, but she's also giving birth to the light. Uh, of that sun through the moon as she reflects it to the earth. <laughs> so she is both male and female in that aspect, just throwing that one in uh, for free. Well, at the very end of the story, of course, bright coit. I love it. So wait, she has she has like light hair? Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, okay. You know, I know many of you are going, okay, I just, I'm haired black for a cocktail. I, I got to go back again. Maybe I did too much. And that's why I'm bold. Okay, so it's okay. You can have black hair, brown hair, blonde hair. The, the, the important thing is, you got to realize, is that all of that fits under her mantle. Right? She's depicted in different ways. But a lot of people will say, if you're blonde, you can't be a cocktail. You can be anybody. Everybody can uh, be connected to her. And don't feel left out because, hey, earlier sources, he has a lot of hair. Okay. So at the very end, a uh, uh, bright coif Hecate came near to them, and often did she embrace the daughter of holy Demeter. And from that time, the lady Hecate was minister and companion to Persephone. Beautiful, hugging, loving, kind, blessed. There she is. How do you guys feel right now? Huh? You feel feel pretty good, right? Oh, I almost hate to go further. <laughs> this is where I, I kind of like to, almost, I wish you could skip to the Chaldean oracles, uh, you know, because I, I don't know. Um, okay, so the groundwork is uh, of connections between Persephone and Demeter uh, are connected. And we're going to see that again in the Homeric hymn to Demeter, right? So we'll see some of that too. But let's move on. Hecate is also connected to Hermes, right? Um, and um, Hermes uh, in the cult of the uh, Thessalian Phere, as well as Eleusis. Both gods were leaders of spirits of the dead uh, who were associated with springtime, uh, the springtime return of Persephone. Well, that makes sense. Now you see where this is coming from. Hecate accompanies Persephone. Persephone what does she do? You know, split her time, right? You know, half the time she's with her mother above the earth. The other half, she's uh, below the earth with, with Hades. Who spends the time with her? Her companion is Hecate. So guess who's going to be in the realm in between? All those realms of, oh, yeah, sky, sea, and, oh, underworld. Oh, no, here it is again. Yeah, she is liminal. She goes into all areas. She accompanies Persephone, so she all is connected in that sense. So that means through Persephone now, building blocks, she must also connect to the underworld, as we know. So why not the dead? Why not the spirits of the dead? Right? So now she's interpreted as being at the threshold uh, in the realm between life and death. It's logical. 
and you can see the evolution of this idea. But it's still positive. It's not a negative connotation, right? And of course, Epivagenia and Hecate, uh, as, as I said before, are connected with Artemis, right? Remember? So let's, let's go there. Why not? Uh, so the daughter of Agamemnon, Epivagenia, which we now know the whole background to, right? What happens is that, oh, I don't even want to say this, but um, uh, here we go. Um, <laughs> There, there is this, 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 this promise that uh, Epiphagenia is going to get uh, married, you know, so she's lured there, you know, and say, hey, would you like to marry Achilles? You know, why not? You know, the real thing is Agamemnon is trying to sacrifice her uh, to Artemis. Yeah, so it's going to happen. Sacrifice to Artemis. Well, so you don't really see her being, you know, well, burned alive, you know, to Artemis. So what do we do with that? Well, here it is. Uh, according to a fragment known as the Cypria, right, of uh, Hesiod, uh, what happened is, is that, uh, uh, here it is, Achalcus then told them of the anger of the goddess. I'm reading from that. And made them sacrifice Epimedia to Artemis. This they attempted to do, setting to fetch uh, uh, Epivagenia as though for marriage with Achilles. Artemis, however, snatched her away, snatched her away, and transported her to the Tari. Where, where's, the, where's the Tari? That's the Taurus Mountains. Where's the Taurus Mountains? It's in rough Cilicia. Where's that? Anatolia. Oh, okay, we're back there again along the coast. And there's like a mountainous area that kind of dips down and in there. Beautiful range, by the way. There's like an opening there, the gates. Anyway, making her, I'm still quoting, making her immortal and putting a stay, sorry, putting a stag in place of a girl upon the altar. So she was replaced with a little dear, old dear, a deer, right? A female deer. Okay, you, you got it. Okay, so that's pretty interesting. Now, the fragment of, 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 of Hesiod will have an, an interesting word uh, for her, uh, for this Epivagenia that is rescued by Artemis and brought to the Tari. Uh, the word is, of course, it's a form of the word, uh, Eidolon, which of course means image or phantom. But what happens is Epigenia becomes connected to a derivative of that word, which is a doulos. What does that mean? Uh, being on the way or in the way. And so Epigenia, uh, as we know, will then be connected with an image, a phantom, an image that is located on the, on the way, on the road. Hey, look at that, on the road. There is a connection. In fact, who makes this connection? You're thinking I'm just making this up, didn't you? No. His name is Pausanias. I'll pause for a moment on that. Uh, he's, a, he's a geographer. Uh, he's a writer. He writes a tour book of Athens. Recommended reading, by the way. Uh, and literally, uh, he, he made the connection that Epi, uh, Epivagenia literally becomes, he actually says, it literally becomes Ekate, the triple face goddess. Of the of the uh, of the crossroads, um, I know that Hesiod, in the catalog of women, represented that Epiphagenia was not killed, but by the will of Artemis became quote Hecate. Hey, see, I'm not guessing. There it is, and we have other sources too. So, is this great. So, kind of going through the evolutionary process, though. So, we're seeing how these ideas connect. Well, it, it, it makes a lot of sense that she's connected to the crossroads. Because she is about the passageway between different realms. So why not the roads, right? So there you have it. Okay. Um, there is, of course, another connection between, uh, with, with, with Medea, right? Medea, of course, uh, Hecate is connected there. Hecate was the mortal daughter. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, according to Deodorus, Hecate was a mortal daughter of the king of Arak, Perisonese who was in turn the son of Helios, 
and the mother was the notorious witch Medea. We have that source. There's lots of sources going on here. But uh, Apollonius of Rhodes says Hecate was Medea's instructor. Here it goes. Instructor in the arts of witchcraft. We're building. Ah, now we have the Witchcraft Association. Here it goes, right? So the goddess said, is said to teach her, Medea, be the greatest exploiter of drugs, pharmaca, right? That grew on the dry land and in the full flowing water. This is important. I want to say this because she's still connected to various realms, right? The land, the sea, she's still connected to the sky. What better do you need when it comes to magic than somebody who's connected to all three realms? Is this fascinating? So yeah, it makes sense, right? Complete sense. And of course, it goes on. It says that grew up, it says uh, with these drugs, she extinguishes the blast of the unwearied flame. With these, she stays the noisy course of rivers and binds stars. Binds, there's the heavenly aspect, you know, said that earlier, there it is. And the paths of the sacred moon, sky, earth, and the sea. She still has an aspect. Things are still pretty good, but she is now more and more being connected with magic, right? But, you know, and of course, Medea, you can see where the connection, Epiphania, you know, Epiphania, Medea, remember that going back? So you see all these derivations? You're probably learning way too much. I should, but anyway. So Medea advises uh, Jason uh, on a spell, and of course, it is connected to Hecate. Uh, Ovid uh, will say, uh, will also make the connection. Uh, that the, in fact, in his version that's connected to Medea, uh, he has Medea say, Hecate of the three heads, who uh, who knows all about my designs and come to help the incantations and the craft of the mages. So now she's starting to be connected more and more uh, to magicians. So it's, it's happening. Here we go. So uh, we do have her also connected with various uh, animals too, um, and like the weasel. <laughs> you know why? Why is she? Why is why is the Kate connected with the weasel? Well, it's the connection to uh, Galantius. Uh, the Galantius. Uh, this was a this was a maiden. She's like a playmate uh, of Alchemy. Uh, that's the um, daughter of Electron. Basically, this is the one uh, that is, is, is going to be giving birth to, to Hercules. So anyway, so she's the playmate. And what happens is, is that, well, unfortunately, um, Alcamene or Alcamena, she gets uh, pregnant. And the fates and Eletheia or the birth goddess, they're kind of on Hera's side. They, 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 don't, they don't want her to give birth because they think it's going to be a son. So, so what they do is uh, Morai and Elethea, what they do is they richly close their legs so that, uh, that uh, poor thing, uh, Alcamea may not, can't give birth because she's going to have these really bad birth uh, pains. I mean, she's going to feel labor pains, a lot of pain. And then what happens is that, uh, there's a reason why I'm telling you the story, don't worry, is that, is, uh, uh, well, uh, Galantius, she 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 goes up to them, and she says, "Good news, uh, she gave birth to a girl." <laughs> and they're thinking the son, and they're thinking maybe Hercules. So they stop that ritual magic of closing their legs, and of course, as a result, Alcamea or Alcamena is able to give birth to Hercules. Of course, they find out you don't trick a goddess, let alone. You know, four. <laughs> You're gonna bore right? Uh, so what they do is they turn her into a polycat. They turn her into a deceitful weasel. Uh, and you, here we go. There's a reason why I'm telling the story. Hikate feels sorry for her. What? 
Yeah, she feels sorry for her about her transformation and her appearance. And so she appointed her as a special servant for herself because she didn't think that was fair. Oh, yeah. So this kind of tells you more about um, her character right, as a goddess. And I know I'm looking at my time, it's going away so fast. But um, but we're all having a blast, aren't we? Right? Right. Um, so let's talk about this. So now more and more she gets connected to the underworld and um, they start forgetting the, the higher levels in many cases. Uh, the night realm, the realm of phantoms, sorcery, uh, 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 and she's connected uh, to the roads, as we already know, especially that cross each other. Right? But she has also many different companions that stay with her. As I mentioned, uh, uh, she is connected. Um, um, oh, here's one little story you may not know. Uh, in some cases, she has three bodies with three heads, and one is a horse. The second is a dog, and the third is a lion. You're thinking about these connections. Of course, the horse has this Poseidon feel to it, right? The earth shaker feel to it. This earthly aspect to it, you know, but the dog. That's a little curious. The lion, of course, comes the majestic Kimberly tradition, right? The Anatolian tradition where lions are important. They call her sometimes a three-headed monster. So you have that, right? And you will say that uh, she doesn't have any offspring, that she's a virgin, that nothing can come from this. Well, so she's sometimes depicted wearing a maiden's knee-length dress in some cases, right? You know, others say that she had offspring, like uh, Scylla, for example, right? You know, uh, and others as well. So it's kind of up in the air. Uh, Hecate is also connected with the Chalcian nymphs, uh, Perseus and Adea. So we have that possibility. And by the way, I got to say that she's connected to servants that are offsprings in her, in a sense, later on with the Chaldean oracles, uh, as well as Neoplatonism to help the vortices. Uh, but anyway, that's a whole other story. Hecate was known as the uh, Phosphorus. Phosphorus, what is that? She is the light bearer, right? She carries the torches in both hands. Uh, the roots of this tradition can be traced back to, again, the Minoans and the Mycenaeans. You can see this. In fact, Eleutheria, right, uh, has very ancient roots, especially in Lycian Artemis, right, was shown as the fire-bearing one, as we know. In fact, uh, there's even an inscription, uh, CIG 6797, where they mention the Cretan Lady of Ephesus, known as the Light Bearer. <laughs> and so there you have it. It's, 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 so it's fascinating. In fact, we see the light bearing connection, even the island of Lemnos, which, by the way, is right between Anatolia and Europe, and connected to Venice. It's also connected to the Thracian Artemis, connected with Hecate, and you, yes, and of course, you can see the connections there. Fascinating stuff. Okay. So, uh, one little interesting tidbit, and I found this in Athenaeus in the Biblos office. This is, this is fascinating. You know, yeah, phosphorus, many scholars will say phosphorus is connected to the word bosphorus because Hecate, uh, Byzantian Hecate, uh, we have lots of sources on her being worshipped as connected to the liminal spaces in between what? Straits, right? But between Asia and Europe. Oh yeah, no wonder you have that connection. Even when we get back into Agamemnon, this idea of crossing the threshold and the, the Artemis stuff, and you have Ephedonia, and oh boy. So, so we may have phosphorus connected to the word bosphorus. So, but again, it just depends. You know, these Greeks, they come up with lots of these, these, these words that connect together. They mean not, but I just still think it's very interesting. And the idea of holding two torches, we see this also uh, very much show, so with, with, uh, with uh, Artemis. I, think, I look at took it acquainted to Artemis, like at Ephesus and other places, I see her depicted pretty much the same as Hecate with those those two uh, torches, you know, one in each hand, 
Uh, she's also connected to Lance, right? And this connects to the Illusion Mysteries. So she is um, one that's the enlightener of the mysteries through her light. Uh, she brings about an understanding of deeper mysteries. And of course, that goes into the idea of copper bosses as well. Uh, she holds she holds a dagger. We have a lot of that. Uh, the Argonaut, of course, is described with a blade uh, that uh, cut the Caucasian herb, right? And Medea cuts the throat of a ram when he sacrifices to Ikate, right? So we see this. Of course, the killing of the black sheep with the same kind of blade. You have the keys of Hikate, right? Uh, she holds the keys. What, what, what she holds? She is, a, in fact, she's understood as the key holder. Like in the Orphic hymn to Hikate, right? She is key holding mistress of the whole world. She, she opens up the gates of the underworld and decides who goes to the Elysian fields. Well, that kind of makes sense, right? Because she's connected to the underworld. Now you know why. And I'll just give her the keys. You're going to see references to this idea of keys that becomes proverbial to uh, any god or spirit that holds a, holds a, a connection to the underworld aspect. Hikate is mainly the idea. It's funny because you'll find within in the Christian tradition, you'll have the idea where, where you have Jesus, of course, holding the keys. This is the idea of, as opposed to Hikate or the underworld uh, spirit holding or God holding the key. So this idea just kind of floats around, right? She also has a scepter. You know, she wears this diadem. It's pretty beautiful. It's a golden scepter, right? She has a prominent headband, right? So we have that too, a shining head, headband on bright, coiffed, or, you know, a Hikate. So then... She's a pretty bright, bright figure, you know. So she's connected to saffron. That's that's holy to her. Uh, saffron, of course, was used to dye cloth in red and yellow colors. Um, and so, but saffron is connected with her. It's fascinating because the Minoans uh, were very much into saffron. It's holy to them in connection to their, and the Mycenaeans, according to their spirits. So we have that. He was crowned sometimes with oak leaves and coiled with wild serpents, right? So we have lots of things. Okay, so sometimes she's a psychopomp, right? She is connected uh, to the crossroads. I, I want to make sure I get to someplace. So that's kind of moving ahead. I'm only page 17 of 55 pages. <laughs> so you know there's a lot here. <laughs> but I want to make sure that you understand what we're going through. So... I'm just taking my time, but time is out, so it is. I just want you to understand that she gets connected uh, to the three-way crossings. Um, of course, you know, you know, Chrysophocles and his root eaters, Lord Helios, Holy Fire, Sword of Hecate of the Rhodes, which carries over Olympus as she attends and as she traverses the sacred crossroads of the land, crowned with oak and woven coils and snakes falling on her shoulders. Uh, but uh, she is connected to the crossroads. Uh, uh, in, of course, you know, obviously, uh, Virgil uh, says in the Aeneid, Hikate, whose name is Howled by Night at the city crossroads, right? Even in the fourth century, we have in the, in the Greek magical papyri, it mentions the idea that the crossroads are sacred to Hikate and magic. In fact, this magic says, uh, take a triangle potsherd from the place where the three roads meet. <laughs> and that's used for uh, a magical uh, record, a magical uh, usage. Sometimes she has four heads. Not a forehead. She always has that. But she has four heads. Just saying. So we see this also. This is connects to the elements. Uh, so you're going to have, for example, the horse. Uh, the horse head is connected to fire, right? The bull. Uh, it's, con it's connected to air, the hydra, uh, the water, the dog. Here we go. Connected to da da da. The symbolism of the dog is the earth. There we go. So that means that there are going to be sacrifices, unfortunately, dogs. When they do ceremonies to the underworld, because the dog is connected to the underworld and the howlers that, that end or with Hecate, as they talk about when Hecate approaches, now you have a howling 
and the barking of dogs. And you can always detect their, yes, things are getting darker, unfortunately. So, but there we have it. Hecate, of course, is connected to the lunar goddess. Uh, so, uh, and uh, we, of course, uh, the moon. You know, the moon is important. So, so she is the intermediary uh, between the moon and the sun, uh, between the uh, sensible and eligible worlds, right? Okay, well, uh, we have also um, asked other aspects. Let's just talk about, because we got to get there, let's be pragmatic. Why not? So I'm going to give you some practical aspects of the God thing. On the 30th of the month, when the sun catches up with the moon, they come together, typically a flat cake with candles on it was offered to Hitate. That's a day, yeah. So before that, on nights when the moon was in the final quarter, offerings of cake and fish and eggs and cheese, uh, they were offered at the three-way crossings. So uh, where's my source? Uh, quite a few, but I'll just say Athenaeus and his Diplosophists. He says, a flat cake dedicated to Artemis having lighted candles all about it. Of course, later on, you find out it is uh, the one that is the amphibiophon, which is connect the idea connected to Artemis and Cockney. Also, just for fun, uh, they also offered cupcakes. <laughs> cupcakes, yeah. So, um, And I have the recipe here, if you want. Uh, Honey, sip of flour, eggs, yeah, you know. Anyway, there you have it. Now, fish was also offered to, and because remember, she's connected to these liminal spaces and she's connected to fishermen and they prayed to her. And so, yes, obviously, fish are going to be connected uh, to her. Uh, and some people connect this to um, going back to Artagatis, but you know, we can go there later if you wanted to. The red mullet. It's considered sacred to her, uh, but you know, uh, you can't eat it because you know they thought that it turned red because it ate bodies and it was the blood that's in the mullet to make it turn it red. So, don't do that. Uh, eggs, by the way, if you're wanting to know, uh, they're connected to purification and they're raw eggs. So, if you hard boil the eggs, you just ruin it. <laughs> so, so, these are the meals served. What are they? Uh, they describe it as a dip mug. Uh, this meal was served to Hecate, as I said, once a lunar month. It's the last day. Um, you know, in fact, if you guys want to know the exact time, I'll go ahead and give it to you. A flute this mentions. Uh, it is observed at when the first visible sliver of the moon can be seen. <laughs> How's that for exact? That's when you that's when you make the offering. There are, there are a few reasons why they observed this meal. Uh, first, of course, Ikate was the liminal goddess of these various places. She's the boundary between life and death. So she is to be honored. She's to be appeased as well because she literally holds the space. Uh, second, of course, um, under her charge were those, uh, those souls that kind of long for vengeance. <laughs> and they want to get out. Hey, remember she holds the keys? So you got to make some kind of offering to make sure that they don't get out, right? So you don't want them coming back there. The third is, is, that, uh, is that this is how uh, you are purified. Your family, members of your family are purified through this ritual. These are pretty much all good reasons to, uh, to do this, uh, this, this activity. So um, the ritual uh, contains a sacred meal. That's that's placed near the crossroad. Second thing is, of course, you make the offering. And the third, of course, the household is purified. As I said, fish, raw eggs, cheese, leeks and onions too. You know? However, not all families are near a three-way crossroad. They're not all close. So it was kind of far from their home. I love how humanity changes things around. Your door threshold is kind of a three-way crossing because you walk out and kind of spreads out the other side. 
So if you're kind of a lazy, uh, you know, Hikate worshiper, <laughs> you just go to your threshold and you could do your offering there. Now, however, you when you make the offering, you're not to look at it. You know? So you turn around and you walk away and you, that's it. That's over, right? Um, uh, so many Greeks uh, don't even venture out in the evening because they don't want to come across not only their offering, but somebody else's at the crossroad because it's forbidden. It's taboo to observe it. Taboo for everybody except for, I love this, if you're heart hungry, if you're starving. What? Again, generosity. What do you mean? Yeah, you know, um, if you're hungry or you're starving, as we know from Plutarch and his Moralia, for example, and Aristophanes as well, right? Ask Hikate whether it is better to be rich or starving. She will tell you that the rich send her a meal every month. This is food placed inside her door front shrines. And that the poor make it disappear before it is even served. Unquote. And so they people, so the idea is she doesn't curse them. She wants them to eat it. So this is food for those who are hungry, who sometimes even travelers are allowed to have some, right? You know, so uh, that's why you kind of wonder maybe Paul, the apostle mentioned that it's, you know, maybe it's not so bad to eat food as sacrificed to idols because he's a traveler and all those hungry travelers, <laughs> you know, you want to throw a little snack along the road and hey, there's a lot of that there. By the way, uh, in the Johannine tradition, you eat sacrifice food sacrificed to idols, you're in trouble. Of course, for Paul, it's like, just don't be caught, you know, dining in the temple, uh, eating that. But, you know, it's on the road nobody sees. <laughs> have a snack. Yes, have an egg snack, you know. <laughs> okay, so is this helpful, right? Okay, so that means that she cares for the poor. Uh, she's she's given them sustenance, all right? Now, of course, you also have an inside ritual. Oh, yeah, you, of course you have that, too. The inside ritual, the first part is, of course, you fumigate, you clean the space up, right? Usually with a clay sensor, you know, just kind of put it everywhere. Uh, and then, of course, after that, uh, you do the you, you remove uh, all the offerings that were placed in the altar beforehand. It has to be completely clean. Nothing there. Only then. Oh, by the way, if you drop something on the floor, it's the context. You don't pick it up. Uh, so that's that's the rock there, <laughs> because that's to be offered up to her. Okay, but you clean it all up. <sighs> then of course, uh, um, you know. Um, then of course you make the offering. And after making the offering, then you make sure you clean it completely up again, and you do purification. Okay, well we can talk. We're we're almost out of time, but I do want to go a few different places. I just want to mention that yes, yeah, she's connected the bowls. Uh, she's connected to doggies. I don't, I'm glad, very happy that I won't have to talk about dog sacrifice. because That's really sad, but I do have all about it if you're interested. Uh, cause you know, I told you dogs are connected to the earth and, and at Ephesus, uh, I was there in 2008 when, uh, they discovered, um, a site dedicated to Hikate up on Mount Pion. And, uh, yeah. And of course they found inscriptions connected to sacrifice of dogs to Hikate. That's just uh, part of it, unfortunately. But I mean, she does love dogs. I mean, what happens is the dogs get sacrificed. You know where they go to? They go to her and she takes care of them. So I know it's hard for you to think this way because I do too. I have, I have a dog here. You know, the dog's not too happy for me right now. And, and she's, I think she's saying something. Uh, okay, anyway, so uh, no, it's its meant to, uh, she's, she's kind of like a messenger. The dogs are messengers. And that's supposed to be a good thing. She's connected to wolves as well, uh, untamed ones, wild ones, obviously. She's connected to horses, like those with the horse head aspect. She's connected to dragons or uh, dracon, as in, you know, basically huge, gigantic water snake. <laughs> so that's what she's connected to. So, and we talked about the saffron connection. And she's connected to bronze, and she's connected to irons, especially in magical rituals. And of course, um, she, there, there's something called Hikate magic that she's connected to. Uh, of course, it, it requires certain kinds of atmospheres and then uh, certain kinds of actions and certain words. But 
we don't have time to go through all that, unfortunately. And then, of course, you're going to have uh, various, the, the Greek magical papyri, which I have, of course, 15 pages on. But uh, we don't have time to talk all about that. I do want to represent, talk about the fact that still in the uh, Greek magical papyri, there is a charm of uh, Hikate Arishkagal uh, that has survived, that has the famous words, Aske, Apaske, Ase, Ase, Edion, Ax, Etetronon, Prop, right? The Ephesian letters, right? And that really does parallel Lucian's descent of Menippus into Hades, right? And basically, it is a, a, a formula for ritual descent, you know, ritual descent. Uh, that goes all the way down, right? The spell follows, I have been initiated. I went down into the underground chamber of the back piles, and I saw the other things down below, virgin, bitch, and all the rest. Now you're supposed to say it at the crossroads. I'm still reading it. And turn around and flee, because it is at those places that she appears. Saying it at late at night, it will reveal it in your sleep, and if you are led away to death, say it while scattering seeds of sesame, and it will save you. So this is a, uh, could also connect to a mystery religion. It's a ritual of descent, of death, and renewal in life. In many ways, she is the one who saves. So she is a salvic aspect, or she's Hikate Sotorea, and she is used by that epithet, okay? So she is... Connect with salvation. Not the dark talk that you thought you're going to get, is it, right? It's pretty light. I still have a few minutes. And the good news is, it is good news, is that because I started late, you guys are going to give me a few more minutes, aren't you? Yes, you are. I know you are. <laughs> Not that much. Don't worry, don't worry. I just want to make sure that uh, we get to the happy conclusion, right? So as we get to the Greco Roman area, so we're going to the, um, I, I just want to mention that. Um, First of all, Lagina. If you ever have a chance to go to Turkey, visit Lagina. Uh, it's worth it. There is a big temple there. Uh, and uh, there is even uh, was a procession uh, between Lagina uh, and a nearby town. Uh, and there is even a key holding celebration. <laughs> yeah, it, they actually take the keys of Ekate uh, and they originally do have a procession uh, from one place uh, to the other. Uh, you got to also understand that, um, uh, here we go. Oh, wow. Okay. If you want to ask me questions on Artemis of the Ephesians and Hikate, I will talk about that later during questions because I wrote a book on it. <laughs> it's published. It's on Amazon. So uh, it's called Artemis of the Ephesians. And I go in depth in the connection to Hikate in those chapters. So, but I don't have a lot of time there. Uh, I will just say, as I'm turning pages like you cannot believe at a very fast pace, uh, that uh, the Ephesian Artemis is directly connected to Hecate. Long story, exceedingly short, is that, is that you have sacred places throughout Ephesus. Uh, you have the, the site of the Temple of Artemis, which is uh, was the site of a sacred tree, uh, uh, which, of course, is connected to the Amazons. There's an image that was located there. And that has connections to the goddess Hibbele. Uh, then on the opposite side of Mount Pion, which is a mountain in between the two, you have the Ortigian Gardens. That's connected to Leto and uh, giving birth to Artemis and Apollo. In between that, you have this mountain by the name of Mount Pion that's dedicated to the great mountain mother. Around Mount Pion, they had a cemetery. A cemetery used to be there. And what they did is they, they worship Hecate a connection to that circular cemetery around that mountain. Yes. And so you can see through our, the Temple of Artemis to the mountain and then to Ortigia Gardens, you're going to have Hikate being connected via its geographical location. That's why they discovered the Temple of Hikate on top of Mount Pion. They also discovered a temple, oh, sorry, there's also a Temple of Hikate, according to Pliny the Elder, at the site of the Temple of Artemis of the Ephesians. They still haven't found it yet. I know exactly where it is. So I'm trying to convince them to start digging there. I, I even took pictures of the area. I'm like, we got to do sounding here. Are you crazy? Anyway, um, 
And so what they did is they used to have processions going from the temple, and it was a circular one around around Mount Pion, okay? And they would there was altars around it, and they would do various utterances to appease the world above, the world below, and of course, you know, obviously the realm of the sea, which is the harbor area. Then there's a triadus on the opposite side. That's where the Library of Celsus is. You know what they call it? They call it the triadus. And if you look at the Mazius Mithridates Gate, you'll realize it's called the triadus of Hecate. And there's even graffiti of Hecate all over the place dedicated to Hecate. It's like it's everywhere. Okay. So there you have it. Um, I then I have, of course, a list of over 100 different names of Hecate. Actually, 200 names of Hecate. Uh, in Greek, as well as what they mean, if you want that. But we have to, I want to close on this. One last note, which will take just a few minutes. <sighs> Hecate. Uh, you know, she kind of descends a little bit because of the magic aspect, because people don't always utilize her the way she should be. In fact, the fact that they're utilizing her at all is a problem, right? She becomes objectified in the worst sense. And so they're thinking that if they do certain things, that she will just do magic for them. Good news uh, with the Chaldean oracles and with Neoplatonism, the Thurgi, it's not working anymore. And the idea is, if you want something done, you don't tell Hikate what to do. You ask her. And you ask her uh, in a kindly uh, and a loving way with devotion. And she, in a sense, is revived as a result, almost to be the goddess that she was prior to all of this. So she is known for her virtues. Uh, she is connected again to the realm of power. She is power. So you have this concept, right? You know, you have the monad, the one, right? That emanates out. And then you have, of course, the second intellect, right? You know, and then you know, then of course that has that knowledge aspect, and then of course connected to that uh, is you have the world soul, which they call da da Hikate, of course, right? And she is the nurturing world soul. She is the cosmic soul. She connects way earlier to Plato's cosmic soul, but of course they go a little bit further on this. Even though I, I do have to say, give Plato, uh, even Middle Plato's credit. Uh, she's connected to the world soul pretty early on, but it gets really developed. Now, you got to have connections between the realm above and the realm below. Uh, they call, of course, these, they call them the depths, you know, and, um, or they call these the vortices or the world swirls. I love that. The world, world swirls. We should just use that. And so what this is, these are little passageways that go from the realm above through the, the liminal space of the cosmic soul, which is a cafe, and then comes to us. So the Thurgist, what they do is they pray in a tornado, right? What will happen is they, is they, certain spots are vortices where are holy spots that they could do the rituals, or they do enough rituals and the vortice like a, moves like a tornado, moves to that area, and they make a connection, a magical connection between, uh, of course, obviously through Hikate uh, all the way through uh, to the Monet. And so she is the intercessor that goes in between. And she is known as the all fiery one. She is also known kindly uh, that, that these openings, passageways, are really like breasts. Yeah, there you know, and we it nurtures us, it feeds us. She has also servants. They're called ingus. Yeah, ingus. I Y N G E S. Now you're learning mysteries that most people have never heard of. <laughs> the ingus, these are connected uh, to. They're they're basically maintainers, right? Uh, and uh, they live in. They occupy three different realms. And they are the servants of Hikate. In some cases, they are the offsprings of Hikate. They are her helpers. And so what happens is, is that each of the ingus, they are actual magic words. So what you ask for, 
you know, they are that. And then that idea goes through these vortices, goes through Hikate, goes through the second intellect, goes into the monad, the first intellect, and the connection is made. But you always have to ask. Most people don't know. I've never heard this before. But, uh, uh, yeah. Okay, so what happens now, and I wanna, this is where I want to close our, our talk. Oh, I could go, I could do a whole talk just on this, and I have. <laughs> but uh, I can't do this. So, but I want to say this. Here we go. Here we close. Is that uh, she is also known as the flowering flower. Beautiful. She is considered dazzling in beauty. And sometimes they call her the savior, Sotorea. That, uh, that because she's able to be in this liminal space, once again, restored between the realm of the sky, the sea, and the land. Isn't that beautiful? It restores it again. The tripartite aspect of her that was originally intended, it comes about once again. Because of that, one can communicate back and forth through these vortices, through this channel, and she's loving and she's kind. Uh, and then what will happen uh, is that is that if you do the ritual, she can guarantee you salvation in the next world. So she is a salvic uh, Hecate. And sometimes she goes through the Ingus, but sometimes she goes directly to you. Here we go. This is where we close. So in the Chaldean oracles, Hecate sometimes goes, you know what? I'm going to appear to you directly. You Thurgus, who are asking kindly for my appearance. And so, uh, even though uh, she is understood as the formless fire, uh, her voice emerges out. Sometimes, what will happen is that uh, she will appear. This is so cool. She'll appear like lightning in the sky, the dark sky. And the oracles then describe this goddess, and she will descend, and she'll be dressed in full armor and bearing weapons, the weapons being uh, metaphors for, for the, uh, the knowledge of Thurgri, right? And she will rise and look at you as brilliant and radiant as the moon reflecting off the sun, and she will give knowledge for the ascension of the soul. And so she ends as a great nature goddess of the three realms. And uh, her conclusion in antiquity uh, is a brilliant one if you are a, uh, a Neoplatonist. And I think that's a perfect way to end this talk. Thank you so much. All right. I'm done. Did you guys enjoy yourselves? Yeah. Yay! Yay! Yeah. Do you feel like you understand her a little bit more? Thank you kindly, sir. Yeah. Thank. Thank you so much, Lester, for being here. Hmm. And Michael and everybody else. So. Somebody in the UK got up at 3.30 in the morning to listen to this. Oh, oh thank you so much for oh, being yeah. here from the UK. So worth it. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can, I, I just want to say that I, I really think that she needs to be rehabilitated. Uh, you know, her, the image, it's, it's ridiculous because you go through the sources and I go through the primary sources and I find more positive than negative stuff about her. And the interesting thing is we always focus on the negative. And I, I, I think we're still clouded in that way. Uh, and I think that's still the presence of patriarchy. You know, I'm the notes to ourselves. We're thinking, hey, you know, it's, we're free of this. And then we make her so dark when she's very, very light. Fine. And, yeah. in, fact, uh, in fact, you know, the funny thing is she's kind of the misfit. Oh, she, think about this, huh? 
Oh, yes. Yeah, so she's kind of the misfit. She kind of breaks the rules. I like that because you know, you know. So, so all the other goddesses, they're gonna, they're gonna, you know, punish this person or do this to somebody. And she goes, oh, okay, I'll give a chance. I'll help them out. You know, I mean, you know, caring for the poor. I think that's pretty good. You know, everybody else can't eat the food, but all the poor can. Oh, she was mean. <laughs> She'd say nobody, right? Anyway, yeah, sorry. Actually, I've often wondered, like, what in practice people did in past, you know, historical points where offerings were common, like what happened to the offerings um, in different cultures. So that was really interesting. I didn't know that. Maybe the bellies of the poor and the pilgrim. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a nice way yeah. of, of, of providing for the hungry. It really is. It was really cool. Yeah, you, just, you know, you know, just don't let those eggs that you be on the sun too long. <laughs> yeah. You know, and you kind of wonder about those cakes too. I mean, hey, it looks like the, the poor are going to get some 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 pastry too, right? <laughs> and why not? You know, but only at the end of the month for that one, right? Any any questions? Any questions? Can I answer all your questions for you? Is there a relationship between um, Hecate and Prometheus? He was also kind of a light bearer known for yeah. compassion towards mankind. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and of course, you know, they, this is a good topic, by the way. Uh, you know, the Titans didn't fare very well with, with the rise of the Olympians. Mm -hmm. And there were, there were exceptions. And of course, uh, one was Prometheus and, you know, one was Hecate. But guess what Prometheus did? Yeah, he blew it, right? You know, he, he he took the he took the took the fire from heaven and gave it to humanity. So it was not good. So that was the end of that, right? So there is so 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 she's like the last Titan standing. Not really. There's some other Titans that got away too. He's but she is honored. To get this, she's honored above all the others. By Zeus. You know, by Zeus according to Hesion. So she, in the seven hundred, she's still way up there because she did not, and I didn't bring this up, she really alone did not betray Zeus. Meanwhile, Zeus uh, took a whole bunch of the other titans and locked them up into chambers under the earth. Uh, there are stories about the seven or nine different chambers under the earth that is connected uh, to Pagan stories uh, that are part of their mysteries. Yeah, so, but she uh she didn't betray him so yeah no wonder she is brought up and seen as such a, a positive goddess uh even within the olympian context yep. although she's not mentioned in, in the uh 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 in the iliad or the odyssey right so you know tell but the end we do any, any other questions yes okay i have so many but <laughs> huh? oh. Uh, suggested reading materials. Uh, suggested reading materials. You know what? I might read the poems yeah. I mentioned. Perfect you know, uh, I, I'm kind of, I hate to say this, read the primary sources. You know, uh, I'm, I'm, you know I didn't get this talk from, from secondary sources. You know that. You saw that. <laughs> you, you saw that for the most part, it's a gathering of primary sources put together because I have discovered that this 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 lecture would never have happened the way it did if I consulted a lot of secondary sources. Because most of it will, will focus in on her darker imagery. And they they also don't do a very good job when it comes to the evolution of the cafe. There's a few good ones. There is, you know, uh, I think her name is Soretta. Soretta S O R T S E. Hers is she's good. Uh, maybe read her work. She's a good one. And there's a few others, but oh, well, you know, it's it's sad, really. You know, it really is sad. I wish there's more. There's a few articles I can find them at the, a little bit later. I don't have one here. There's a few good articles on her. Uh, they're academic articles. But I would say start with the primary sources. It's easy to do. Just do a word search, look up Hecate, and find like Hesiod. Start off with that. Start to go into the Homeric hymns. Read that first. And then read commentaries in relation to those. So from there, the next step where you go is, is read books 
pertaining to those sources and those sources alone. Then all of a sudden, you're going to get a better impression. Uh, but what I skip is the Greek magical papyri, which I have <laughs> over here. It gets bad. I mean, it really gets bad. It gets, it gets, there's some good parts. The Kata Bosses is good. But um, yeah, there's some, there's some, there's some bad parts too, which, which I have here. Of course, I have here. Of course, I have here. Yeah, there's, yeah, you know, it just, it's, it gets into a, more of a darker magic. And this is what I was talking about is that, you know, the Kata Bosses of Hikate Rishigo, it's not too bad. It's, that's, that's good. And you have a few others that are really good too. Uh, but um, there are a, there are a few where she becomes an object. The moment she becomes a, a magical object, uh, I think that's the, that's the moment where the line is crossed. So you kind of have to watch out for those. So, but yeah, she has lots of names too. You know, like I said, I have lots of. I'm going over there to the. Um, if you guys are interested in the Greek magical papyri, I feel it. So I'm going to go over there and take a look around here. Um, Get there. I'm just flipping through pages. Oh, also, she mixes with Jewish magic. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah. Um, in fact, I have a I have a Jewish magical spell. You guys want to hear it? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. This is from the second century. Alatea, Kor, Oreo Bazgora, Hikate, a tail eating, Moon. If be, we devote these people to evil. <laughs> Body, spirit, soul, intellect, reflection, perception, life, with Ekatean words and Hebraic oaths. Justice, earth, Ekate, under the command of the holy names and Hebraic oaths, air, head, brain, face, ears, eyebrows, jaws, teeth, soul, health, Burn flesh, groan at what he suffers. I adjure the triple moon, middle of the night, whatever nurtured and the divine, running through the heavens, strong handed, observable, blue robed, by land and sea, and doya. We deposit these people with you. You register them for, you know, I'll, I'll just say, I'll, I'll send you the word so it doesn't sound like I'm doing a that's fail. Uh, for punishments, conversational, uh, penalties, conversational. Uh, and revenge, a thing devoted to evil. <laughs> anyway, so I told you they get a little dark. <laughs> That's pretty dark. So they're basically cursing every part from your, from your head all the way down. Yeah, yeah. I, get I told you, but it's Jewish. It's, so they have Jewish symbols on it and everything else. It just they all kind of come together. You know, you get you also have love spells too. You know, um, uh, so you have that. Um, uh, and of course, oh, here's one. Uh, there's ones against slander. Yeah, you got those two. Uh, ones to send dreams. Uh, you got ones. Um, there's a few good ones that talk about her as mother of all things. So you do have some respectful Greek magical papyri. I would say, and I've probably, it's probably this is very fair to say this. I'd say about half the magic is problematic, and the other is not. I'd say about half and half. Uh, that's what that's what I think, because uh, you know, again, if, if you're using Hikate as an object, if you're asking her, that's different. And so, the, the magical papyri go both ways. Um, yeah, um, but some of these, you know, here's a love spell to cause a lover to lie awake for me all for all eternity. <laughs> it's kind of a long time. Oh, by the way, here's another source I just saw. His name is Betz. B E T Z. So uh, that's another great source. Um, and I recommend uh, going through that as well. Uh, you have, um, yeah. like I said, I have 15 pages of Greek magical papyri. And when I mean I have 15 pages, I have the entire magical spell that's written out. <laughs> but uh, I used her for everything, but I, 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 the problem is you just have the rituals, and sometimes there's lots of killing of various animals, and you know that kind of upsets people. Uh, you know, animal sacrifice. Uh, you know, black sheep is, is very popular. Dogs are popular. Uh, bulls are another one that's popular quite a bit. 
Uh, a lot of these are connected to the earth aspect. And that's because she is the key holder between the realms. And, um, but what will happen is that some of the later Greek magical papyri, it, it goes two ways. Um, that's what mentioned this. They either get darker or they get lighter. <laughs> they either become more mystical and philosophical uh, that seem to connect to mystery religions and various rituals, or, you, or, or they seem to be uh, spread out to, amongst the more base members of, of society who just want to have something and want to have it now. So that's the best way to put it. I think that's, I think that's fair. I think that's fair. No. Any other questions on magic? Or mischief, magic and mischief. We could do both. Not on either of those, but I did have a question. Sure. Uh, so I know you said that she represents the three realms: earth, water, air. You know, uh, ground, underground. Sorry, it's here. Yeah, the, the underworld, the, the realm of the sea. The three, and the, realm yeah, the, the realms world, yeah. of the boundaries, and yeah. each animal represents. You said that the horse represents the sea, the dog represents the earth. So therefore, do you think the lion represents the air? And if so, how? Yeah, I'll, I actually will go here right now. The lion represents the sun. In fact, oh, okay. we, will, we will see that on the sarcophagi. Uh, if you see the symbol of the sun, uh, the lion with its mane represents the, the rays of the sun around it. So the heavens, the up the above. Heavens. Yes, the heavens okay. above. There you go. So there it is. It's the sun. Thank you. And she is the moon, of course, reflects the sun. And you'll mm -hmm. see crescents yeah, that's also on all the images, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any other question? Uh, what with, what yeah, did you say the name of her servants are, in Ingus? Yeah. In fact, um, in fact I'm going to go ahead and go further with that if you want. I was, so, I was hoping to get all the way to the details of them. Yeah. Okay, so okay, so they are called. Um, you have the, the I, Y, N, G, E, S. Okay, so literally they are Ingus. They are uh, they're daemons. Some cases they know them as they're under, understood as ferrymen. They're ferrying information. Uh, they transmit all things from the noetic sphere to the material sphere, and then back again. They are messengers like Hermes, right? They form a, a triad. Uh, so there's, there's like three different aspects of them along, and they are understood as maintainers along with the other maintainers. Um, these daemons, uh, they could be good or bad or, or irrational. Uh, they appear during the ceremonies having the ability to convert the soul. Uh, these mediating creatures live in the intelligible world and they are characterized by power. And uh, of course, as you see that, so the, the, I guess do we also have the word itself derives from a bird, which is known as a rhinec. Uh, and uh, it's interesting that um, uh, they would have an image of this bird that was sometimes put on a wheel that they would spin around. <laughs> and that wasn't real mystical here. <laughs> so, so, so these, uh, and so this wheel was also, uh, uh, is called an inks. Uh, so in fact, I even have a, an inks magic spell here, but we're not going to go there. <laughs> so, yeah, but uh, anyway, yeah. So the, 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 the wheel uh, was again, um, uh, you know, this represents the, the energy, the power of, of Hikate. Yeah. So, but uh, they are also known as intellectual supports, right? Intellectual supports. So they, again, uh, connect uh, from above to below. Uh, actually, they're, some, some, sometimes they're expanded and they're connected with the various planetary spheres. And so they represent those kind of powers. In other cases, uh, especially when they're problematic, uh, they are also known as sirens. But an interesting bit, this, uh, uh, Plato refers to them as, they're like sirens is riding upon eight cosmic spheres. So uh, they, they are known to make music. 
sound. Ooh, that's cool. So, so they're, they're each of their, they're, they're, so they're, they're connected to the astral spheres. They have music. It's almost like music of the spheres, right? <laughs> uh, and uh, their music, uh, they, they're, they're, they sing. And their names, each one of their names represents an idea. So there are, each of their names is a magical idea, a magical word. And you say the word, and that connects to this mystical being then comes to you during rituals in which you're asking questions or you know, you're wanting something but you're you're asking but why the good bad because sometimes you gotta ask for things that may not be that good so you, you know you think that you have you have to call upon something uh that's a little little darker okay let's see here um yeah uh, there sometimes the ingus are connected uh to angels i know that sounds strange but there is a realm between angelology and the Ingus because they are messengers too. And they're messengers of above to below. And so as we get to the Christian realm, they're merely angels uh, that connect to something that's higher. She's a great virgin after all, who was burdened below. Well, that connect to Artemis of the Ephesians, but it also connects to the Virgin Mary. Virgin Mary, who we do have in certain cosmologies connected to the world soul. And there you have that connection there. So, uh, so okay, I went there, didn't I? Oh, I loved it. Thank you so much. You, you're welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? I, I told you we're going to be digging in deep today. I have kind of a comment. Up if I can go again, I'm fascinated with the crossroads concept that keeps coming up in your lecture, and. Um, you know, just from my knowledge, it just must have really perturbed all of our ancestors because the concept comes up everywhere you look, like all, all sorts of cultures. I mean, in England, fairies would haunt the, the crossroads. It comes up in Asian history, African history. Um, even I think there was like a blues guitarist in the 30s who supposedly got his blues guitar Tom skills Johnson. from selling his soul. Yeah, it's just amazing. It must have really uh, struck a chord with people it, it sure does yeah it, 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 and this this taps into just these ancient beliefs and customs and there are so many explanations for the symbolism of, of, of the triadus of the three-way crossing it, it becomes exhaustive uh, sometimes they, they say well you know the third the, the, the final prong is the mystical problem that you don't see and that's where the image is so your cheese at the threshold you know you know so you have the you know the road and you have the fork and then cheese at right there uh, holding the passageway to the other realm. Um, and you're going to see that happening. Now, once again, we'll, we'll, we'll bring back Ephesus. So this is what happens at Ephesus. In Ephesus, what they will do is at the Triodos, they will build a gate, a portal to that, that, that uh, extra prong that goes forth. So the Mazis Mithridates gate was that uh, at the Triodos. And then what will happen is when they built an agora commercial agora there that was fine but when they, they they blocked it up processions couldn't go through there anymore so they built another triadus further up the street uh during the time between hadrian and and um uh, between trajan and hadrian and that triadus then went to the ortega gardens so so once again so you do have this idea that uh, she is at that threshold area and mystically the liminal area she carries on to the other side does that make sense yes yeah. that's, that, that's the ancient that's the ancient idea as we see, see through archaeology and then we'll, i think we'll, from a practical standpoint too like a crossroads back in the day if you're traveling a lot of those trick, trick, trickster gods would point you in the wrong direction they will and you know yeah. back in the day traveling was dangerous if you know if you went the wrong way at a crossroads you, you know you could be days out of your journey you know so yeah it's a dangerous crossing point you know it's a, it's a time to, to pray. That's why you need herms there too. In other cases, right? You know, you know, protecting travelers, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. so you have Hecate as well as you know Hermes, right? Protecting messengers and travelers, and you need that needs to be you know needs to be done. So these are great prayer points. Like pray in the right way. I pray there's not somebody hiding you know at this crossroads. No GPS. No GPS. No GPS. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You go the wrong way. That's it. Uh, and that happens, yeah. happen, that, you know, the crossroads are a dangerous place. If we just look at any literature, almost, civiliz almost civilizations, 
people are panicked about what's waiting at the crossroads. Yeah. Because, yeah. and you know, there's a reason why. It's a real boring one. Here's a real boring reason why. Especially when we get to the time of wheeled traffic with chariots. You have to turn. <laughs> right? right? And when you turn, yeah. you're vulnerable. Right? You know? Uh -huh. Yeah. You can be attacked. Yeah, it's a perfect time because by the marauders. You, know, you could choose you had to build momentum. But when you're at a crossroad, you gotta slow on down. You're forced to slow down. And you go, whoa, whoa, even with your horses, right? Whoa, whoa. And then you then you have to turn left, turn right. And that's the perfect time for people to go to get you. Right? Yep. As opposed to you just zooming on by. It reminds me of like traveling out west in the uh old American days, like when the you know when you'd have to cross over like a creek or something, you know, your wagon would be in danger and, you know, you could break a wheel or something. Yep. Yeah. And that's where you would break a wheel is those areas. Yeah. And uh, also the other part is, is that crossroad when it comes to the drainage, it sometimes becomes problem problematic too. So you're going to have lots, lots of dips and other, other areas that will kind of throw off your wheels. There's reasons, you know, because remember everybody's turning there and they're all turning there. What's a paved road? You're going to get ruts, and yeah. there's going to be more weight on that physics. And then again, your wheel will come off. You can you go too fast. Hecate will help you. Hecate will help you. Yeah, or or Hermes, right? Yeah. That's what I'm saying. She's not a. She's she's pretty helpful. She's not as dark as people say she is. She's you know you know there is a dark aspect, but from her, her from the perspective of ancient times, you still have this. He's there to watch uh, watch after you, yeah. There's the duality, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, because well, yeah, because she's connected to the realm of death. Then again, you know, Hades is connected to the realm of death. He doesn't do anything that's too evil, right? He's not he's not evil in a Judeo Christian sense, you know. And he loves Persephone, and they're down there, and you know, he's doing judgment, and you know, it's like, hey, Lizzie and Fields. I mean, that's you know, he's deciding these things, and. Or through his judges, right? And or you know, Tartarus, you know, he's meting out punishments for the evil and giving rewards for the good. I don't think that's a and then and then meanwhile, Hikate is in the realm of above and below. She's she's transitional. She's the one that keeps all those spirits from haunting us, right? It's coming back from the grave. So hey, that's that's a that's a bonus, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know? So and just as long as you remember to do it once a month. <laughs> 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 on the 30th day, you know, the sliver of the moon, you know, so I can, I can see some of you going, okay, we're waiting for the sliver. Because <laughs> we're going to do it exactly at that time. Yeah. But uh, yeah. any other questions? I'm actually really curious about your take on the conflation between Hecate and Celine in the PGM. I actually think it's really beautiful. It's because really it, beautiful. it describes like almost a country. There's, there's, almost a paradoxical element to how there's the dark and there's also this wonderfully beautiful aspect of her where she's she's both you yes. know and she can yes. be both as needed yes yes yeah. well, it, she is the she is the, the she is the the light shining in the darkness she is the moon shining in the in the night and uh so so she is giving light of knowledge. She's giving light. Think about it. You know, we have a moonless night, mm. right? So we want, you know, a moon night is a good thing because it does give us light. We got to think the ancient world. So thank you, Celine, for, you know, as full as you can get, right? And uh, yeah, there is, there's, there's a poetic aspect of the Greek magical papyri between the two. And you see their names being used interchangeably uh, throughout it, as, as you probably already know. But yeah, there is yeah, there is there's a realm within poetry. Those are the good ones. Those are the good spells. <laughs> where, where where Celine is, but then you're going to have, of course, you know, others too connected to her. Rich Gagal is another one uh, as well. Uh, right. You have darker ones, but but I do but yes, um, absolutely. Uh, and there's there's a lot of literature on Celine. I have another section on that too, and um, I think that. Uh, um, uh, we also have, um, uh, I think they split. And uh, in, in what happens is that the, the two are co connected to each other, but uh, e the magical traditions 
still we paint it, but she loses the Celine aspect, and then it comes back with the with the especially when we get to the Chaldean oracles again and Neoplatonism. All of a sudden, she's bright and strong again and true, and that Celine aspect comes come through, and that moon aspect comes through. But there is like there's a dimming of the moon, so to speak, and uh, I can't even tell you exactly when. Uh, first century. <laughs> first century BCE, first century CE, not a great time uh, for, for Hikata, uh, looking at a lot of the sources. It gets a little better, but um, that was dark. And um, you're going to have even uh, some Christian apologists kind of going off on this one later, later on as well. But, uh, but things get better. Um, but, but, she, she, but you do have two different realms. You have the magical realm, and then you have the, the realm of the Chaldean and Middle and, and Neoplatonism. And so it almost it becomes uh, intellectualized here, Hecate, while here she becomes still holds on to a very materialistic uh, conception where half the time she is, she is used as an object. But here within the realm, I'm using my arms, I'm sorry, but here within the area of Thurgi, within, within the middle uh, Neoplatonist, Platonic, and obviously the Chaldean Oracles, uh, there, there's, there's a Thurgi, there's a higher pursuit of her uh, as, as, truly, as truly pure as related to the cosmic soul. But, here we go, as related, as represented by the moon. And that moon is Selene. So yeah, they, they they would use that word for it, and that's I know it's a long ways to get there. <laughs> I was getting there, and so so she's presented in that aspect uh, again. Um, yeah, good job. Yeah, uh, so you, you. sounds like you, you would read these materials as well. So just a bit, just a bit. Yeah, you do a part really two awesome. for your other notes. Huh? You definitely need to do a part two lecture for your other notes that you've got. Oh, yeah, yeah. That we couldn't cover today. Yeah, I could actually do a whole lecture someday on just the magic of the Kate. Let's do that. Because I have, you know, 15 pages of sitting there. <laughs> I should, yeah, you definitely Double need to do up. that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, there's so many places I could go. I mean, as it is, I guess, you know, I just, I, 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 had, I had a stop on a page uh... 55. See, okay, maybe part two and part three then, you know, because she's the trickle aspect. <laughs> yeah, the funny thing is, I only got to, I think I already got to page, uh, I think I got into the 20s and had a skip. So yeah, there's a whole bunch of materials that I didn't get to. But I yeah, think, definitely think, part two and part three then. <laughs> you guys have a, it's a good idea of who she is, right? So at least, um, and I want to take time. I don't want to rush through it because uh, otherwise... Somebody had to go, I, I know, I choose the magical diary. I gotta get to the good, you know, neoplatonic stuff, you know, I'm gonna have a happy ending. Otherwise, I'm just probably be stuck in the first century someplace, you know. Uh, and that's the end of Hecate, <laughs> you know, connected to with, with, you know, the, the darker forces, and, you know, and you guys are like all depressed. And, okay, have a good day. <laughs> that's a, a terrible talk. <laughs> all down and depressed you know you know yeah. so we, we, we should have rehabilitated so i always like happy endings so but yeah definitely book part two and part three and yeah we'll all be there more, i can do more on it yeah thank you for being here yes yeah, yeah. any any other questions the sky is the limit now it is you know i see her i'm actually really curious on your take on there's a a really funny figure that I've run into. I'm not quite sure. It's actually almost a conflation of Hermes and Hecate called Hermicate. What what would your perspective be on that? Now, um, I am not equipped to answer that question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 that's good. No, no, I, I like that. I always like when I get a question that goes, hmm, I have to think about it. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a good scholar. <laughs> So, so, yeah, what do you know about it? Uh, I just know that somehow that's a blend of Hermes and Hecate, and that Almost, uh, I mean, crossroads of yeah, so yeah, yeah, and and that um, that this is someone that has figured somehow. That I'm guessing it's because they, they you know, you've got you've got. Um, what, what's the term? The psychopomp aspect. Psychopomp, right. right. And also 
um, that you know, just there's probably a sorcerer's connection. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Apart from that, I'm like completely drawn a blank. I mean, I just well, run across well, the name. Yeah. Well, well here's the thing. I, I think you. I think you've also run across at uh, of this image at various museums mm -hmm. because they will they will have this image uh, that connects the two together. And um, sometimes it's pole like, but it's like a, like a, like a, oh, and we know that would be at the edge of the, maybe, no, I'm really asking, I shouldn't even do this. Uh, it maybe is, you know, the Termes is there at the crossroads and Hecate is at the crossroads and they're both connected to the realm of the underworld. Why not combine them two together as flip sides of one and, and the other, right? Become even more powerful. I almost it, maybe it's maybe it's a time saver. <laughs> what should we have? Maybe. We have a, exactly. Have a there or mm -hmm. Hermes. Hey, why don't we just have a Hermes Hecate? By the way, there, there's there's also images called Hecateans, mm -hmm. which are pretty cool. Uh, that will um, that uh, will be images of Hecate that were used for magical reasons. And, um, but um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, but um, it uses magical implements, and maybe this uh, this was just a magical connection between the between both. Maybe somebody who's listening to this will go, "Oh, I know what that is," <laughs> and we'll say so in the comments. But uh, yeah, no, I appreciate that. Uh, my whole thing is I always want to learn. So when I hear something, I'm there. Great question. Thank you for asking. Uh, Thank you for listening. Uh, oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm I'm into this. Any other questions? Even questions I won't even be able to answer. I'm I'm for it. It's, Form of learning. Anybody? No? I think I have a, no, no. Okay. Wow. I, I answered, guess you're all waiting for lecture number two. I yeah, at some point I'll put this together. Well, I, I guess I answered your questions, right? By by the way, I do have a um, another talk that is just on the Chaldean oracles. And uh, you know, and I have another talk. That's just on Thurgi as related to uh, Neoplatonism. So it's kind of throwing that one out there. So, <laughs> you know, so because I, I, I'm very much into the philosophical aspects. So, but um, the Chaldean oracles are really cool. That was a popular talk, wasn't it, Terry? Did people show up? I don't know. Maybe nobody showed up for it. I don't know. I'm talking by myself, and I think everybody's there. I think that Terry might be muted. Oh, okay. Yes, I sorry, you're unmuted. I was doing sign language. Um, oh, okay. It, it, it was a fascinating. She, she's, she's like this. Like, okay. It's like, what? Can they an article? That sounds like a crowd pleaser. Everybody's like, it wasn't something that people immediately recognized the title. You know? So it yeah. was harder to get people. But yeah. um, it was a great talk, though. Yes. Yeah. Um, definitely. I go in, in the Chaldean oracles, I go into detail on how they worked. I think that's kind of cool, you know? I'd personally be very into that. Yeah. 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 Me too. Yeah. I'm very pragmatic it. about it. And so, yeah. So, yeah. It does. I mean, if we can get a, a, a large group, I, the talk is already written. So, um, I'll do that one. Uh, it, is, it is fascinating. And the whole, by the way, a large portion of it is on Hecate. So, I mean, yeah, it's just it got the, from the context of the Chaldean realm going into Platonic. All right. What, wonderful, uh, Jessica. So, okay, well, since I have answered all the questions, not every question, I'm sure there's other questions, but um, I will just call, say adieu to you and you and um, um, looking forward to seeing you all next time. Until then, have a great night.